All right, you've got a lot on your minds? Probably have a lot on your hearts. You came here, you might have had a great morning, or your morning might have been completely thrown off because your body's an hour off its normal schedule. But now we take all of those things, and we don't just forget about them. We hand them to the Lord. We're here to worship Him through all of these things in our lives, not in spite of all of these things in our lives. So let's take a moment of quiet where we can come before the Lord individually and ask Him to give you the strength today to worship Him the way He deserves to be worshipped. Let's do that now. Let's all stand together to God be the glory. question today is baptism with water the washing away of sin itself no. no only the blood of Christ and the renewal of the Holy Spirit can cleanse us from sin okay I'll be reading from 1st John chapter 1 7 through 9 but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we shall have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and forgive us of our sins, and purify us from, un from all unrighteousness. God showed us his love by sending his, only, his one and only son into the world, that we might live through him. There is a song on the radio called The Man on the Middle Cross that shows God's love for us if we confess our sins and trust in Christ Jesus. If we thank God for sending you, if we thank God your, for sending your son to die for us and for help forgive us of our sins. Amen. Nothing but the blood can uh, wash away our sins. Maybe I'll stand. <clears throat>
Today is a day that around the world, across denominational lines, the Church of God turns their attention to focus on their brothers and sisters who are living in places that they are facing extreme persecution simply for the fact that they are a follower of Jesus Christ. Right now, statistics from our International Mission Board tell us that more than 360 million Christians worldwide suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith. In the case you're curious, a high level of persecution is more than somebody leaving a nasty comment on your Facebook page. Many of them are facing the loss of life. They are facing the loss of their businesses. They're facing the loss of their family simply because they are followers of Jesus Christ. According to the ministry of an organization called Open Doors, the numbers of countries where Christians suffer high and extreme levels of persecution has almost doubled in the last 30 years. We're prone to forget that because we live in a country where, yes, there is persecution, but not to the level that many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are faced with day in and day out. I cannot see statistics like this and, and hear of the persecutions going on without remembering the opportunity I got a glimpse of it in Turkey. Remembering the time where I sat down at a table with 12 other people, there were 13 of us, and between the 13 of us, there were three different languages that were being spoken, and not one person that spoke all three. And so you constantly had to wait for what you said to be translated into one or two other languages. And I remember one lady crying at that table because she'd never seen that many Christians in one place at one time. We get 13 people to an event and we think something is really, really wrong. And she's rejoicing. There's 13 of us here. One of which we met on that trip wasn't 18 yet and couldn't be public about her faith because if she would come out as a Christian, her family would take her back into a village and lock her in the house and not let her get out and she would not be able to be discipled. I'm thrilled to tell you that she's still a believer today. In a large part due to the work of our International Mission Board workers who are still in Turkey, even though most have been pulled out. We live in a world that hates the name of Jesus Christ. We live in a world that when they hear that you are a Christian, would rather take your life than to let you utter another word. And yet in the midst of that world, we are reminded that Jesus spoke to his disciples, turned apostles, and he said, I send you out as lambs amongst the wolves. Jesus knew the dangers, and yet he sent people anyways. Let us pray today for those who cannot gather as we are gathering right now. Let's pray. First, Father, we thank you and we praise you for the truth of the gospel. We praise you that our comfort comes from you. We join with Paul and we pray the words that he wrote to the Corinthians when he said, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Father, there are many who are sharing abundantly right now in the sufferings of Christ. We pray not only that you would give them peace and safety, because, Father, we know that is not always your plan, as you did not give peace and safety to your own Son. Instead, Father, we pray for a spirit-given boldness for all believers and wisdom to handle difficult situations. We pray, Father, that you will use persecution to strengthen your church and to continue to embolden believers to stand for what is true and right. We pray that Christians around the world would be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That they would be clothed with the armor that you provide. That they may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We pray that you remind us that we know persecution will come that we will not complain when it comes, but that we would know how to suffer well. We pray that you would use the testimony of those who are persecuted and that it would provide opportunities for them to share the gospel with their neighbors and even with their enemies who persecute them. We pray that they would not be discouraged, but that they would be emboldened by the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that you would remind all of us that we are not alone. Even when we do not see our loved ones around us, remind us of Jesus' promises that he would go with us even unto the very ends of the world. And so, Father, help those who are hurting. Help those who are scared. Help those who have lost everything to know that while they may have lost all of the things of this world, they have gained all of the things of the next. For I pray this, not just for their sake, but for the sake of the very name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
The church is one foundation. May we all stand. pray together. Almighty God, creator of the universe, and lover of our souls, we come to you this morning with hearts that are glad. We rejoice in all that you are. We have read of that which you have done throughout history. We desire for our eyes to be open to see that you are still at work around us each and every day. And we yearn for that which is yet to come. And so today with glad hearts, with joy in our soul, we come to give to the work of the kingdom that others may be blessed as you have already blessed us. May we give from that into your bounty, and we give you praise. Amen. <laughs>
Before we pray this morning, I want to share some uh, updates on some of our members that um, we uh, have been praying for and need to continue praying for. First of all, I have a, uh, a praise and an update on Grady uh, Davis. Um, he had a CT on Friday which showed that his largest tumor has shrunk to half its original size, and that's after one chemo treatment. So praise the Lord for that. Um, Grady has a PET scan uh, tomorrow on Monday, and then he will have his second round of chemo on Tuesday. Also uh, on Tuesday, Larry Holt has a procedure that we want to be in prayer for. Uh, Jerry Hall, he has a bad gall, a gallbladder an enlarged spleen, and he has a consultation with a surgeon this Friday, so we want to be in prayer for Jerry and Tammy this week. Um, also, uh, Rose McQuarrie has an MRI on Friday, um, and Harry Ballard has blockages in two blood vessels in his brain and has an appointment with the neurologist Friday of the next week, and we want to be in prayer uh, for uh, Harry. So. Let us uh, go to the Lord now in prayer. Heavenly Father, I uh, first want to pray for Israel right now and their war that they're engaged in that they didn't ask to be a part of. Um, and Father, I pray that Israel would be successful um, in, in their war that they have with Hamas and that they would be able to get their captives back. Father, I pray for those innocent people that are caught up in a war-torn area, Father, that they would get humanitarian relief that they so desperately need. Father, I pray for our follow-up to our Harvest Festival that we had a week ago. Father, I pray that we would be diligent in our prayers uh, for those people that expressed needs uh, that night. So I pray, Father, that you just bless our follow-up efforts there. And Father, for our members that, that we mentioned updates for, uh, Father, I pray for, um, for Rose and for Grady that are uh, both going to be having tests uh, this week. Uh, Father, uh, I pray that you would just uh, give wisdom and accuracy in those uh, tests and wisdom in the uh, processing of those. Um, and I uh, pray, Lord, for Grady as he has his chemo second round on Tuesday that you would just uh, guide him and just give him strength as he goes through that. Um, and I pray, Lord, for Larry as he has his procedure uh, on, um, on Tuesday that everything would go as it should and that there would be no uh, complications uh, from that. And Father, for the consultations that will be coming up soon uh, for Jerry and for, for Harry, uh, I pray, Lord, for... Um, for wisdom there in the, the doctors as they uh, talk to, to Jerry and Harry. And I pray for understanding on Jerry and Harry's um, uh, parts and that you just uh, guide, just give direction, Father, as to what next step should be there um, and to bring about a healing of those if it be in your will, Father. I lift up Rick Simpson uh, to you. We miss Rick. I uh, pray for continued healing for Rick as we look forward to the day that we will be able to see him again soon and hopefully very soon. Um, and now, Father, as we turn to 1 Corinthians, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word and the preaching of your word. Amen. If you would, take your Bibles and join with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 11 today. 1 Corinthians 16, beginning at verse number 5, we find these words. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace 
that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now there's an odd set of verses to read and to look at. It almost feels like we've taken somebody's letter out of the mailbox and read the letter that didn't belong to us, and we're seeing things that, quite honestly, there's nothing we can do about these things, because I don't know if you know this, Paul is not planning on visiting us after he's done in Macedonia. He's not currently working in Ephesus, and by the way, Timothy's not coming here. And so there's a temptation when we come to these verses to say, do I really even need to read the last chapter? I mean, there's always so many personal things that don't deal with me, that have nothing to do with me, that I cannot do anything about. And yet, for some reason, God the Father, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, moved upon Paul to write this into a letter that God preserved from Corinth getting it until us reading it here today. So there's something that God would have us to see as we read somebody else's mail. And if it feels like you are reading someone else's letter, it's because we're reading somebody else's letter. Okay, just state the obvious up front. Okay. So as we look at this, while we cannot say, all right, we need to prepare ourselves for Paul and for Timothy, and we got to be nice to Timothy, we can see something very clearly in this about the heart of Paul towards the Corinthians. Now, you might think he wouldn't like them very much. They've caused him all kinds of trouble, and his stay in Corinth wasn't the greatest stay that you could ever hope to have in a particular city. There was a lot of troubles that he ran into, and They've got a number of issues here. They're accepting sexual immorality and they're split up in a whole bunch of different groups following a whole bunch of different people and they've been suing one another. They've been fighting over marriage. They're not doing the Lord's Supper right. Instead, some of them are getting drunk while they're taking it and they're having arguments on what they can serve for dinner and what they cannot serve for dinner and... Some people are running around the worship service speaking in tongues and interrupting one another and all of this is going on. And Paul says, I want to come see you. And I don't want to just come in passing. I want to come and I want to stay with you. Even in if it's winter, maybe it might be the entire winter time. Now, winter's not a good time for traveling. If you're stuck there at winter time, you are stuck there. And Paul's saying, I'm willing to be stuck with you. I, I want to come and because by being with you, you're going to be able to help me on my journey. Now, he's not just saying, you're going to pay my bills. That's not what he means. There's a help that comes from being around the people that you know and the people that you love. Now, I am one of the kings of the introverts. Now, many people don't believe that because of my job, but my job is one of the greatest ironies the Lord can put out there. Let's take this guy who would rather sit in an office and read books and not talk to anybody all day and put him in a job where he's required to talk to people every single day. That's hilarious. But even me has to admit that I enjoy spending time with my family. Even I have to admit I enjoy having people over in my home. While I need a lot of time to myself, I am built up and strengthened by my interactions with other people. And many of us right now are already making plans for the next two months of Who's traveling where? Am I traveling to you or are you traveling to me? And when can we get together? And how long is the visit going to be? And what happens if we can't make this window? Well, we'll aim for this one instead. And all of these plans are being made, even though for some of you right now, you're going, I really don't want to see that person there, but... It's the holidays and we should get together. 
Because even when we butt heads with one another, something happens when we sit down at a table with one another that goes beyond the mashed potatoes and the turkey and the flying spoons. There's an encouragement that comes that we get from being with other people. That's why we go through this time in and time out. And we're in an interesting time in the history of the world where there's a lot of people who are still nervous about being out in crowds and large gatherings. And we've learned in isolation that's happened. We've started to reshape our culture to where you can be isolated on an island. Now, some of you are going to relate very well with what I'm about to say, and some of you are going to marvel that this is the case. But right now, I could go home and tomorrow order all of my meals online and have them brought to my home. And I can check a box where I don't even have to see the delivery person. I can check a box to say, just leave it by the front door. And I can wait until they leave to open my door and bring the food in. And then when I've had enough of fast food being delivered to my home, I can go to a grocery store site and order every grocery that I want in any quantity that I want and then push a button and they'll bring my groceries to my door. And I can wait for them to leave and I can bring it inside. And when I dare go out, I might need a car. I don't need to go to a lot anymore. I can surf a website and find a car in another state and push a button and they'll deliver the car to my door. I don't have to go out and see anybody anymore. And for some of us, it is simultaneously the most terrifying and wonderful thing to ever happen. And in the short term, it's wonderful. Thank you, Lord, that I can have a cheeseburger from Dairy Queen and I can stay in my pajamas. I used to be limited to pizzas. But now I can get ice cream and fried chicken, and even a salad if I'm crazy. And it's wonderful for a while. But then I need another cheeseburger because I'm just not feeling very well today, and maybe the cheeseburger will help me to feel better. And you know what? It might half melt before it gets here, but maybe what will make me feel better is another blizzard. Or maybe I, if I go on Amazon and I order literally everything that I need on earth. Shoes, socks, belts, clothes, games, tools, food. And they bring it to my door. When I open it, then I'll be happy. But hear me when I say this. There has never been and there will never be a replacement for the presence of another person in your room. We are designed, created by our Creator, to be in physical relation with other people. We are meant... I'm going to say this out loud and you're all going to throw it in my face and I'm going to regret it, but I'm going to say it. We are meant to hug one another. We're meant to hold that handshake that extra second. We're meant to throw our arms around each other and say, I'm so glad you're here. That literally, scientists have have discovered that hugs actually lower blood pressure. Because our body goes, there's someone else. So while we have this desperate need for connection, and let me tell you, text, I'm not even going to lie, texts are awful. Awful. 
I mean, they exist. They serve a purpose, but text is not what I'm talking about. Phone calls, okay, they're nice and they're a little bit more helpful than text. Video chats, are, we're, we're moving the right direction. But all of those three things combined will never equal someone being in the room with you, talking with you, and sharing their life with you. They just they, they can't touch it. Because we're meant to be together. And while COVID did not wipe out the earth, thank you, Lord, it did start to inject something into our culture and our society that terrifies me that we're not going to reclaim, and that's the togetherness Because we have a whole generation that learned about separation and how much you need separation. That's losing the ability to be in a room with someone and have that conversation. And to experience the difference between chatting online and being present. And Paul says, look, I'm sending you a letter and I'm planning on coming to see you. But I don't want to just see you in passing. I want to be with you. I want it to be a time where you can look at me and know I'm not leaving tomorrow. Because there's three stages of visits. There's the visit that's going to be a short-term visit that you're geared up for, you're psyched up for. Okay, you're going to come in, we're going to do something together, and then you're going. And I'm happy about that. Praise the Lord. And then there's the next visit that a lot of our holidays run into It's the, okay, you're going to be here for a while, and you're making it through that visit, and you're constantly looking, how long until they're leaving? What time are you? I know you're leaving tomorrow, but is it before or after 8 a.m.? After? Are you sure? Traffic's pretty bad, right? Time for you to go. But then there's a point that happens in those extended visits where you're no longer watching a watch, and you're just living together for weeks or months at a time with someone, and you go, you know what, there's something really nice about this. And Paul says, that's what I want. That's what I want with you. I don't want it to be a short letter. I don't want it to be a short visit. I want to live with you guys for an extended period of time. And I think, now I'm going to go on a little bit of supposition here. So for, indulge me for a moment. I think the reason that we long for presence so much in our lives and need it so much is because we're created in the image of God who for whatever reason we cannot explain or express says, I want to live with you. The craziness of John chapter 1 where the word of God put on flesh and dwelt with us. Now in the scheme of things, 33 years, 34 years was a very short time. But he dwelt among us for years by choice. And what was the goal? The ultimate goal was that God would make a people for himself that he would come and dwell with them. The point of Jesus coming to earth was so that God could be with us. That's crazy. We often think about it, well, I want to go and be with him. And there's, a, there's scriptures that point us in that direction. But read through Revelation. What do they sing? The dwelling place of God is with man. Paul says, I want to come and I want to be with you. And God says to us, I want to come and I want to be with you. He knows your sins. He knows your failures. He knows that you say with your mouth all the right things when you're in church, that you can answer all the Sunday school questions and, and lay it all out there. He knows all of that. And yet still he looks at you and says, I want to be with you. I know your failures this week. I know what you did. I want to be with you. 
I saw what you did. I want to be with you. It's no wonder then that we can know the faults and failures of our family and our friends and still say, I still want to be with them. It's no wonder that one of the most famous songs that you're about to hear over and over and over and over again is, I'll be home for Christmas. And we really hope that it's not only in my dreams. We really want to go. So we want to be with them. So Paul, if it's so good just to go and be with them, then just go. Nope. Here's a problem. Look at verse 8. I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. What a crazy guy Paul is. I can't come right now because there's work I have to do right now. There are things that need to be accomplished, and the door is wide open for me to do it. Now, he spent a lot of time in Ephesus. Again, not all of it good. There's a lot of work for me to do here. And then he throws in that crazy line. Oh, and by the way, there's a lot of adversaries. There's a lot of people who don't want me to be here. There's a lot of people trying to kick me out so I can't go. <laughs> Paul, if there's adversaries, if they're going against you, if, if they're making you bang your head against the wall, then go somewhere else. Paul says, no, no, no. If the devil thinks there's really something going on here that they're willing to fight, this is where I need to be right now. This is what I need to do. Let me be persecuted. Let it be hard for me. Let it be difficult. But no matter what, any of that, this door is open, so I'm not going anywhere. So I'll see you in the wintertime. I've got to be here now. What kind of attitude do you have when there are adversaries? Is it, well, this one's difficult, let me go where it's easier? Or if it, is it, Lord, thank you that there are people opposing us right now, because that must mean we're doing something right. If I'll be honest, I start out with A until somebody reminds me I'm supposed to be B. When it's hard, part of me goes, you know what, all right, that door, that doesn't look like we should be going that way. Maybe we should back off a little bit until somebody says, well, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to have persecutions? Aren't we supposed to have sufferings and difficulties? And I go, oh, yeah, okay. All right, let's stick it out. Let's see, let's, let's go forward. I need to be reminded of things. I had to tell my Sunday school class today. I need to be reminded of some of these truths. And my guess is so do you. That there are times when things are coming against you and you're ready just to shake the dust off of your shoes and, well, too bad for them, I'll go try over here. Paul says, I want to come to you guys so bad, but there's a wide open door and it's real, there's a big fight going on here and I can't leave it. This is where I'm supposed to be. And then I got thinking about this whole thing about God wanting to dwell with me and the fact that I really want to go and be with him. And that's what Paul wanted too. Ultimately, he didn't want to be with the people in Corinth. He wanted to be with Jesus. Yet, as he says in Philippians chapter 1, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But knowing that there's work to be done, I'm convinced of this. I'm still going to be here. And so, Christian, can I tell you, yes, we long to be with God. We long to get there. We're waiting not just for the holidays travel, but for the ultimate travel of getting to be with God. But until we go, there's work to be done here. There are things we need to be doing. And it's going to be hard. And people are going to oppose us. People aren't going to like what we do. They might take your name and run it through the dirt. But let me tell you, it's okay if your name is muddied as long as the name of Christ is lifted up. Yeah, we want to be with God. But right now there's an effective work for you and me to do. And it's a difficult work. Look at this last part. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. 
So let no one despise him. See, here's the thing. Timothy didn't have all the credentials that Paul had. Paul basically had the equivalent of two or three different PhD degrees. I mean, he'd studied under all of the right people. He had all of the right, his resume was impeccable. Timothy had nothing. And the people of Corinth, what were they worried about? Give me the credentials. That's what all of the second letter is going to be about. Not all of it, but a lot of it is going to be about. The credentials. And Paul knows Timothy is on the way, and he doesn't have the credentials that Paul has. So what does he do? He prepares the way before he gets there. Hey, I know you guys. I know Timothy doesn't look like much. I know he doesn't have the paper. But don't hate him. He's doing the Lord's work just like I am. When we look at one another, sometimes we might want to be present with this group, but not that group. Because, you know, what? that group, yeah, they think a little bit differently than we do. They're a little bit, now I'm not talking about totally out of the faith. I'm just talking, they're Methodists. I don't want to hang out. Just give us a good Southern Baptist, amen? Don't amen. And Paul's saying, look, I, I know he doesn't carry the paperwork, but don't look at the paperwork. Listen to his message, because he's proclaiming the same exact gospel that I am, so make it easy on him. Amen. Oh, that we would be a church that would make it easy on anybody who proclaims the gospel message. That we would learn that we don't need to be separated all of the times we separate ourselves. But we are one church, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. And that we need to stop despising people simply because they have a different opinion or look different than us. If they're doing the Lord's work, let's praise God with them. Until together, we get to travel to go and be with him forever. Because all of this togetherness is made possible because of the one singular action of Jesus Christ. All of this togetherness is not because they're of the same ethnicity, because they're not all of the same ethnicity. It's not because they're all of the same uh, educational background because some are very educated and some are not at all. It's not because they're all males or all females. They're different on every one of those possible aspects. What's the one thing they have in common? What's the one thing that would make them want to be together? It's the same thing that makes me want to be with all of you here in this room. The same Savior Jesus Christ bled and died for their sins just like he did our sins. The same Jesus Christ was buried in a tomb. The same Jesus Christ rose again on the third day. The same Jesus Christ appeared to over 500 witnesses. And it's the same Jesus Christ that will welcome us home that we can be in his presence forevermore if we but trust him today. And do the work that's laid out before us. This is what we are called to do. To be together in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, help us to be with one another. To open our homes to one another. To live with one another in the bond of Christian love. Thank you that we have people around us today and that we can draw encouragement right now from those who are around us. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would truly be united in the name of Jesus Christ, that we would truly be together through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And forgive us for the times when we draw unto ourselves and away from everyone else that we are neither encouraged by them or available to encourage them in their time of need. 
that help us to truly live lives side by side with those who bear the name of brother or sister in Christ. And let us do all of this, not just for our health, not just for our mental well-being, but let us do all of this for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray even now. Amen. As we sing this last song, let us rejoice in the truth that God is bringing us to himself. And if you don't know that you will be with him forever, and you know you want to be, as we sing this song, come and share that with me. I would love to sit down and open the Bible with you to help you be sure that you know that through Christ's death on the cross for your sins, you can be forgiven and dwell with him forever. If you need to respond, now's the time to do it. Let's stand as we sing. be together. Let us strive to continue to be together, not only in physical presence, but in unity of mind and heart. Let's receive the benediction together as one family. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, we give you thanks that you want to dwell with us and have made a way through the blood of Jesus Christ for us to dwell with with you. And now, Father, as we leave this place today, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen.